tis the season for back to school. Well, for people who are going to school. That hasn't been my life for more years than I'd like to think about. But I still think of this as back to school season. So to get in the spirit of back to school season, whether you are going to school or not, I have a list of books that take place in schools. I actually don't like school settings very much. I usually, if I like a book that takes place in a school setting, I like it despite the school setting. So take that for what it's worth. There might be books you're expecting to see that won't be on here because again, I don't really like school settings. But I promise all of the books on my list have at least a little bit of school setting. The first book, no list would be complete without and is very much the exception when people are like, what do you mean you don't like school settings? One of your favorite books of all time is The Name of the Wind by Patrick Rothfuss. This isn't like just some of the books on my list are like, well, technically there's a school in it. This is one where like, there's very much a school in it. People, I think for years said this was like Harry Potter for adults, which I disagree with for many reasons, but I also understand why that was said. Cause it is, you know, a boy wizard goes to magic school, <laughs> except it's a university, not, you know, grade school and high school. The Name of the Wind, if you've never heard of The Name of the Wind, <laughs> is I guess exactly what I just described. Um, boy wizard goes to magic school, goes to magic university, but it is, I don't know, it's so much more than that. It's, it follows the story of Kvoth. Kvoth is telling his own story. The conceit of the series, The King Killer Chronicle, is that books one, two, and three, three is yet to be published, um, are days one, two, and three of present day Kvoth, who goes by the name of Coat, telling his life story to a chronicler. So in the present day, we have a third person narrator that's telling us about Coat's present circumstances or Kvoth's present circumstances, but the majority of the narrative is Kvoth in first person, Re re recollecting his childhood, his youth, and his years at the university. In the first book, The Name of the Wind, again, we start out in the present day, and then Kvothe tells us the story of his childhood, where he grew up with his parents in a traveling troupe, and tragic circumstances that separated him from that life, the, the Dickensian years he spent on the streets, and then how he finally makes his way through blood, sweat, and tears to the magical university that holds not only the education that he seeks, but also the libraries of knowledge that hold answers that he seeks. And then his life at the university and um, shenanigans that happen like next to, adjacent to, connected to, related to the university. I feel like that sounds really dull when I describe it like that. For people that like the series, for people that like Patrick Rothfuss's writing, I think the number one thing that people well, maybe not the number one thing, but for me, the number one thing certainly is the prose. Patrick Rothfuss's storytelling is just so lush and captivating and beautiful. There's, I remember when I first started reading it, I was like, there's been 50 pages of like nothing. <laughs> like if I think about like what's happened, it's nothing, but they've been the most beautiful, most captivating, most unput downable 50 pages that I've ever read. Because I think Patrick Rothfuss's storytelling is magical. So following Quoth, you feel like you're there with him. You feel like you're experiencing what he's experiencing, feeling what he's feeling, like, sensing what he's sensing, hearing, tasting, smelling. It feels like this lived in breathing like world that you step into through Quoth telling you about it, which is a, a transport of magical experience. So if you want to feel like you're at a magical university, the, your best bet is to read The Name of the Wind. I also really like the magic system in The King Killer Chronicle, the sympathy magic system. Um, I think it's described really well. And it's, um, I feel like it, it balances really well. It's not like a completely hard magic system, but neither is it like a wibbly wobbly soft magic system. It has, it's fairly clearly explained and its limitations and rules are fairly clearly explained, but it's not really so focused on mechanics, more so kind of like the, if you took a philosophy class rather than if you took like a physics class. So there's, there's parameters to studying philosophy, there's rules, there's kind of like, there's a structure to how you study philosophy, but it's not, again, as like, specifically cut and dry and like mathematically precise as chemistry or physics. So it really works for me and my sensibilities. So if you also are kind of like you enjoy a hard magic system but like struggle with some hard magic systems, might do a whole video on that. Um, this is a good magic system in my opinion. The next one is more of like, a, I guess technically, <laughs> technically it's a school setting, um, Red Rising by Pierce Brown. This is sci-fi, far future sci-fi, and the first book largely takes place at what is called the Institute. Sounds like a place of learning to me. Really, I mean, if we're looking at school settings being classrooms with homework and this sort of thing, then it's not. It's war school, emphasis on war. So in Red Rising, in the far future, society is like heavily stratified into a color-based case system. And our main character, Darrow, is a red, and the reds are the absolute bottom lowest case you can possibly be. And the golds have, are the top, the top of the food chain. And the golds are very into studying war, etc. So they send their kids to the Institute. And the Institute 
is basically a place of like practicing making war but like it's pretty real. It's a kind of a la Sparta, you know, where like if they die, it's because they were weak and we should call the weak. So yeah, it's it's mainly like, it's like war and battle and stuff, but technically it's a school. So can go on my list. <laughs> the next book on my list was quite the trendsetter and that is The Secret History by Donna Tartt. I love The Secret History and I have ever since kept trying to read Dark Academia, you know, the genre that basically was created by the popularity of The Secret History. And with extremely few exceptions, and even those exceptions don't quite meet the mark, nothing, nothing does what The Secret History does. So The Secret History, the OG Dark Academia, is about a group of classic students and it's like a very insular small group that study together with this kind of like weird obsessive professor. And you know at the outset of the book that one of them dies at the hands of the others. So you don't know why that happens or how that happens, but you do know at the outset that that is what's going to happen. And so then you follow these students as they're studying classics and as they are having interesting relationships with each other and with their relationship to academia. And yeah, it's just like a very character driven, character focused, quite contemplative book. And I think that's why it works. Um, one of the things that I complain about so much when books claim to be dark academia or are marketed as dark academia is that there'll be dark books that also have academia. And that to me is not dark academia because part of what makes the secret history dark academia is the academia itself is inextricably linked with the darkness. It is their relationship to academia that is dark their obsessive, unhealthy relationship with studying classics. It's not just, oh, these kids have some bad behaviors and they are doing murder and stuff and they happen to also be students. Like, the, the reason for bad things happening is the academia. It's not like both are coexisting. So Dark Academia or Dark Academia, most other books I think miss this. It's that it is, academia is the catalyst, it is the reason, it is the thing that makes the darkness happen. And it can take many forms, it doesn't have to be exactly like the secret history, but it shouldn't just be like the setting for dark things happening. That's not dark academia. That's just a dark book that ha happens to take place in an academic setting. Does that make sense? So Donna Tart did it first and did it best. And if you love beautiful, velvety, gorgeous prose, if you are a lover of Rothfuss's prose, for example, then I would highly recommend The Secret History. And I would also say, I've heard people complain that the book is pretentious and it is pretentious, but I would say that that is a feature and not a bug. And by which I mean the students that this is being written about, their relationship to academia and their the way they regard themselves is pretentious. And so the way the book is written reflects that. So it's I'm not saying it's impossible to criticize it for this or that it's you, you're not permitted to dislike it for this. If you are irritated by the writing style, you can't help being irritated by the writing style. But for me, it's an important distinction that the author isn't themselves being pretentious necessarily. The author is employing a pretentious tone that reflects the attitudes of the characters in the story, if that makes sense. So I think it's gorgeously and brilliantly done and I highly recommend it. Oh, also one more thing about the secret history and about dark academia that people don't get, that the secret history is not meant to be aspirational. It is a cautionary tale. And much like romances that think they're emulating Wuthering Heights and are romanticizing Wuthering Heights, people who romanticize dark academia are getting it wrong. Donna Tartt wasn't writing this to make you go, oh, I wish I was like that. That is the wrong message to be taking from the secret history. On the lighter end of things, the next book on my list is Carry On by Rainbow Rowell, which is a weird, um, like, the, the circumstances of what this book is is a little bit complex to explain. So uh, Rainbow Rowell wrote Fangirl, and Fangirl is a contemporary um, YA book that's about a girl who's going to university and she is the author of the most popular fan fiction that exists of the series of books that exist in the universe of that story that are very extremely similar to Harry Potter. Um, and she has written slash fiction about like in universes Harry Potter called the Simon Snow books. So Simon Snow books exist in the world of Fangirl and they are much like Harry Potter where there isn't like a big romance in it or anything like that. Um, you know, boy wizard, etc. fights evil darkness, etc. So she has written a fan fiction called Carry On. And so Fangirl follows her and also the sort of like um, anonymous fame of, of writing Carry On and of finishing Carry On and the pressure of that and about, you know, feeling this relationship with fictional characters, etc. So Carry On, the book that I'm recommending, is not the Simon Snow books that exist 
in the universe of Fangirl, which are the straightforwardly Harry Potter-esque books, Carry On is the fan fiction story that takes the like Harry Potter-esque character and the Draco Malfoy-esque character and has put them together in a romantic relationship, which is what the character in Fangirl did with the characters that exist in a book that doesn't do that with them. So I hope that's clear. So basically, yeah, it's like Harry Potter slash fiction, but it's not Harry Potter. That's what Carry On is. And the books I think are very, very fun in their own right, but they're also very fun in terms of sometimes being a commentary on Harry Potter, a commentary on fan fiction, a commentary on our relationships with fictional characters. Um, the magic system in Carry On I find very amusing and like arguably better than the magic system in the real Harry Potter. So um, I think they're a great time. They have great humor, great characters, great atmosphere. They're just a really good time to read. And I personally would love to attend their magic school. Next up is a book that is definitely more so on the, I guess, technically. <laughs> <laughs> and that is Jade City by Fonda Lee. Definitely not one that you'd think of immediately for a list of books about school settings. But if you don't know anything about Jade City or the Greenbone Saga, the Greenbone Saga follows like mafia-esque clans in an Asian-esque inspired fantasy world that is more contemporary in its aesthetic and technology, but it is a secondary world. It is not our world. But the level of technology and the type of society depicted is more akin to like 70s, 80s, 90s, our present day, than like swords and sorcery and medieval fantasy. And it follows again a mafia-esque kind of like system, um, these clans in the Greenbone Saga. And we follow primarily the Call family, and the Call family is the like sponsoring clan of the Call Dusharan Academy. And in the world of the Greenbone Saga, these this jade-based magic system they have a formalized training and formalized education for how to use jade. And so at the Call Dusharan Academy, they are learning how to use jade. They they do show the school setting and the Call family is involved with like school politics and with like backing the school a lot. And some of the some of the characters in the story do attend the academy. So it's it's there. And there's also like drama with like the other clans academy, which because there's beef, you know, the beef of the families translates to beef between students. So there's definitely Especially in the first book, um, because one of the characters is younger in the first book. That same character is older in later books and no longer at the Academy, but they're younger and attending the Academy in the first book. Um, technically, but also just generally, if you are, if you haven't read Jade City, I mean, where have you been? I thought I was the last person to read it. So if you are, in fact, the last person to not read it, um, read it. Next up is a true academic setting. This isn't a technicality, and that is Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. I think that's right. Um, Truly Devious. It's by no means a perfect series, but I really enjoyed it. It is a YA mystery series that takes place at a boarding school. And this boarding school is like for very kind of like elite, special pick me <laughs> kids. And our main character is at this boarding school um, to solve a cold case. So there was a murder that took place um, at the, this, this boarding school used to be like a, an estate, like a private um, family residence, a very enormous um, rich one. <laughs> And there was a murder that took place there. I think it's in the 1940s or somewhere thereabouts, but it's, it's you know, quite a ways, quite a while ago. And our main character is interested in solving that cold case while she's at the school. And then of course, there's also like present day mysteries that start happening. So we kind of have two timelines. We're predominantly in the present day um, trying to put together this cold case, but we do get some flashbacks to the original cold case. I love the boarding school setting. I love a mystery. It's isol it's kind of an isolated closed circle mystery because they are at this remote boarding school. So it's by no means perfect. The mystery is dragged out to three books, which I do think is a little bit much, uh, a little more than it needed. I think it could have been told in one or two books, but I just enjoy the setting of the school and I like the characters. Um, so so I had a good time reading it and I would recommend it. Next is a book that like definitely has a school setting, but also like you'd be forgiven for forgetting that. <laughs> that is The Raven Boys by Maggie Stiefvater. The Raven Cycle, which is the four books, Raven Boys is the first book. It's literally named for the fact that the the four main male characters, and there's also a female main character, the four male main characters, the eponymous Raven Boys, they attend Agley and Bee Academy which has as its like crest a raven. And so our main female character who does not attend Agley and Bee Academy, she refers to them as raven boys because they all wear this crest. They all have these matching uniforms. That's literally the reason for the name of this story. But like there's very little like screen time devoted to them actually attending school, which kind of makes sense since our main characters don't all attend the same school. The four boys do but the female main character does not. She goes to public school. And so like for them to interact, it has to happen basically like outside of school because they do not go to the same school. 
But the fact of them going to this academy is like pretty, it looms over everything that's happening and looms over their identities and the difference between their status, etc. So it's like present in a very significant way while not being actually depicted on screen very much at all. So yeah, I, I the uh, Maggie Steve his writing style is certainly not for everyone. I do have a video on the Raven Cycle. Her writing style very much is for me, but I know a lot of people for whom her writing style does not work. This isn't just like lyrical lush prose like with Patrick Rothfuss or, or uh, Donna Tartt. Her prose is heavily like metaphorical and whimsical. She says a lot of things that like don't actually make literal sense that are meant to convey the vibe of something, that are meant to convey the feeling and the tone of something, even though what she is literally saying should not be taken seriously because it cannot possibly, like it doesn't actually describe anything. If that, I, I don't know if that's making any sense. So she'll often, when she describes like how somebody looks, she'll just say that they are a certain thing when they clearly are not that thing. But the, the intended message is that you're meant to understand that their appearance kind of evokes this kind of a feeling um, or is reminiscent in some way. If someone said that somebody looked like a fox, they wouldn't literally mean that they, you know, have red fur and a snout, but there's, you know, something kind of fox-like about their appearance. So her phrasing about places, settings, people, everything is kind of this like really metaphorical, whimsical way of phrasing things that I really enjoy, the kind of wordplay of that. But if that's not for you, then her writing style is not for you and I do not recommend the Raven Cycle. And her magic is also just as kind of like, un you cannot pin it down. So if you're good with that, then it's a vibey great time and I recommend it. But if you want things to be more concrete, don't ever read my Yeasty Water. <laughs> Next is a book that I actually enjoyed way more than I thought that I would and that is The Atlas Six by Olive Blake. Back when this was like first getting picked, I think it was self-published to begin with and then traditionally published. And I got an arc of it as it was being traditionally published. So I never read the original. Um, I don't, I I heard people tell me like what was changed, but I, I don't know. I've never read how it originally was. But anyway, so I got the arc of it and I kind of was like, well, this is probably gonna be like a cringy, BS CW kind of thing. I tend to prefer that in television than in books. I'm much more on board with like bad TV than bad books, but that's kind of what I was expecting out of it. And so it actually impressed me. So I guess I would say like now me recommending it is going to give you high expectations. So I'm trying to tell you to go in with the low expectations like I did. I expected it to be like cringy teen drama CW kind of tone. And I'm not going to say it's never like that, but the book was much more complex and well thought out and had sort of hidden depths and darkness, much, much more so than I was expecting. And I was prepared for it to be like, again, very vapid, very silly, very surface level. And so again, I was surprised that the characters actually kind of had a lot of depth, nuance and complexity. The story and the magic and the, the setup of everything was actually kind of complex and interesting. Again, I don't want to set your expectations like on the moon, like it's not the most complex or the most deep or the most morally great thing I've ever read. But what I was expecting, it very much surpassed my expectations. So I was very pleasantly surprised by what it actually had to offer. So if you thought that if you, unlike me, if you heard what it was and expected it to be CW-esque and it therefore did not read it, unlike me who was like, all right, let's read it. Um, it is better than that, much better than that. So I would say give it a go. Like don't expect the world. It is by no means like the most quality literature on this list. But again, it's surprisingly good, at least in my experience, in my opinion. I haven't read the second or third books yet. I'd want to. But yeah, again, I was very pleasantly surprised. Oh, if you don't know anything about the Atlas Six, how do I explain the Atlas Six? I guess six students are like chosen for this kind of like super secret, super fancy, super dangerous school school. And that's really all I can say about it, I guess. Yep. <laughs> oh, and I would say my complaint about dark academia where like um, the, the darkness should sort of come from the academia. As much as it's possible to say that for a book that's so speculative, I would say it's more so true of Atlas Six than most other books that like want to cash in on the dark academia aesthetic vibe trend. Next up is a book that definitely, again, is usually found on these dark academia lists. And this is by no means a completely 100% um, recommend. I, I, okay. Let me just say it, Ninth House by Lee Bardugo. I liked the first one quite a bit. I did not like the second one, and I don't know if I'm gonna continue the series. But that being said, I did like the first one, and I generally would recommend the first one. The first one had a lot of flaws that I hoped would be corrected and fixed and improved in the second one, and instead the second one doubled down on the things that I did not like about Ninth House. But Ninth House, the first book, is pretty good. Ninth House follows our main character, who is going to Yale, the real life Yale, 
but Yale has in real life secret societies and Lee Bardugo having attended Yale was fascinated with the idea of those secret societies having like supernatural speculative powers or something speculative related to those secret societies. So that's what this book is. It's our main character attending Yale and becoming involved with these secret societies and the dark magic that they're involved with. And it's sort of a murder mystery type of plot with lots of speculative stuff going on. So it's a book that's like, it was Lee Bardugo's first adult book. And it seems a little bit like, you know, baby's first adult book where you're like, that means I put in all of the, the bad, scary adult things. And it's like, okay, only if you need to though. Like, it's not like you have to put those things in because it's an adult book. Like, you know what I mean? So like, it seems to kind of like overplay its hand a little bit on that, like almost for shock value at times. So I would look up trigger warnings if you're concerned. And my one of my main problems with Ninth House, I had several. One of my main problems with it was the pacing. So it took me a while to get into it. Once I got into it, I found it to be a pretty page turny compelling read um, that ended on a note that made me want to read the next one. Unfortunately, the next one's not that good. I think the book would have been better if it had been structured a little bit more like Harry Potter in the sense of Harry doesn't know about wizard school and neither does the reader. And then Harry finds out about wizard school and so does the reader. And then Harry Potter attends wizard school. So if our main character had not known about the secret societies and was like introduced to them on page and then we get introduced to it on page as well, I think that would have worked better. Instead, the book starts out with our main character already a part of the secret societies. And then we're kind of getting caught up on like how they work and the magic of all that. And there's like some flashbacks kind of showing you how she got introduced to that. I think it would have been better to start with, you know, fresh, more chronologically, where we don't know anything about it, just like the main character, and we find it out with her. So that would be like one of my biggest criticisms for the structure of it. But if you're willing to kind of push through the beginning, I think it's a pretty good read. It's a very atmospheric read. There's lots of, you know, dark, ooky spooky stuff going on at Yale. So if you want to, you know, back to school, fall, dark, university vibes, it will definitely deliver that. And last, and probably strangest of all is Vita Nostra by, uh, I don't remember the author. And I believe this is translated from Ukrainian into English, I'm pretty sure. Um, it was definitely not written in English to begin with. And I, I wonder if that makes it a little bit even more difficult and strange to read. But as far as I know, it is pretty much equally strange in its original language. Vita Nostra is, I mean, it's weird. It's super weird. It is definitely like an academic setting. Um, our main character, is attending a school that I honestly don't even know how to explain about Anastra. To read it is to just accept that you don't understand what's going on. Um, I did really enjoy it though. Um, I've heard there's another book and I think it's out and it's been translated. So I haven't read that yet. I am interested too. By Anastra, this is really unhelpful. I didn't think ahead of time about how I was gonna try to explain about Anastra. I think going in blind is fine. I didn't really know anything about Vita Anastra. It had just been recommended to me when I was complaining about dark academia, always missing the mark. A lot of people recommended Vita Anastra to me. And while it's no secret history, Again, it's much better at kind of like the darkness is the academia and the academia is extremely speculative and bizarre and kind of like hard to pin down. And there's some wibbly wobbly timey whiny things going on in Vita Nostra that again, I kind of throw my hands up at and I'm like, I accept that I do not know what's happening right now, but I think it's compellingly told. It's very atmospheric and for all of its like ambiguity, um, the parts that are comprehensible are thought provoking, if that makes sense. So. If you're kind of willing to just kind of go with it and go in blind, then I would recommend Vita Nostra. And actually I do have one more that I thought of after I made my list and then forgot to add it to my list physically, but I've remembered it now. The Betrayals by Bridget Collins. Now I didn't like this as much as I liked The Binding by Bridget Collins. There's, and that's mainly to do with kind of like a twist at the end that I didn't really care for. But The Betrayals overall is an academic setting and not nearly as like bizarre as Vita Nostra, but kind of similarly to Vita Nostra. The thing that they are studying, the thing that is like what they are discussing most of the time when they're talking about what they are doing at the university setting is never explained. And it's never going to be explained. It's not something you're meant to know. And they kind of talk around it and they kind of talk about things that are adjacent to it or like to do with it in a way that kind of gives you hints at kind of like the type of thing that it would be, but it's never actually explained. And I think that's to its benefit because the point of the story isn't really the thing that they are doing. It's their relationship to the thing they are doing, which is again, the thing with the dark academia, like the darkness comes from the academia. So I wouldn't quite say this is dark academia, but it is kind of an obsessive, um, all consuming relationship with this thing they are doing at this school. It's been a couple years since I read it. I think they referred to it as the game or the, the great game, the, the grand game, 
the Grand Jeu, which is French for game. I think that's what they call it, the Grand Jeu. And again, it's never explained what that is. But like, music is to do with it somehow, but that's, it's not music, but music is related to it. <laughs> again, it's not explained. But the way they talk about it, and it, it's more so kind of like about the way people discuss like kind of these ap academic pursuits rather than the academic pursuits themselves. So like the way academics approach their subject of interest, the way they approach studying it, the way they compete with each other over it, whether or not it has implications for the wider world and whether or not academics concern themselves with it. These are the types of questions that it's interested in. So it doesn't actually matter what the Grand Jew is. What matters is how these people are interacting with a place that is teaching that or, or creating that or engaged in that. So again, I thought it was a very um, thought-provoking read. I didn't, again, I didn't love the twist in it, but I did nevertheless really enjoy the read and it's certainly an academic setting. So yeah, that's my list of back to school books. Let me know if there's some you're expecting to see, some that you are shocked to see, if you've read all these and you hated them, if you read all these and you loved them, if I've piqued your interest, whatever you want, let me know. And I'll see you for my next video. <laughs> Bye.